young electrician suffers an agonizing death. The victim's hair may determine whether it was a job-related poisoning or a deliberate act of murder. The wife and mother-in-law of a police officer die from apparent heart attacks just weeks apart. A paper trail leads to a possible double homicide and a bizarre double life. An engineer with no apparent health problems becomes mysteriously ill and dies. A bounced check triggers a relentless search for the truth. Poison is a silent killer, but not completely undetectable. By utilizing advances in forensic technology, detectives can now expose the perpetrator of an invisible death. September 7, 1991, paramedics were called to the home of Robert and Joanne Curley in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Joanne told emergency technicians that her husband, Robert, was in unbearable pain. Though they could not immediately identify the source of the problem, they found his vital signs were dangerously low. The 32-year-old electrician was rushed to the hospital. Doctors there were already familiar with Robert Curley. They had treated him for a rare nerve disease just a few days earlier. At that time, Curley complained of pain in his hands and feet, as well as hair loss and severe nausea. Now, the escalation of Curley's symptoms caused them to reconsider their diagnosis. The hospital's neurologist quickly ordered new tests, this time for exposure to toxic chemicals. Two weeks later, doctors confirmed that Robert Curley was suffering from exposure to thallium, a toxic heavy metal. Thallium, a naturally occurring element, was widely used in pesticides until the early 1970s, but was banned from widespread use after researchers determined that exposure to concentrated amounts could be deadly. Its use is now restricted to industrial purposes. Forensic toxicologist thing. Dr. You Frederick Reeders explains the effects of thallium poisoning. It's a nerve poison, and it starts out very often with burning feet, and then you start getting ascending paralysis, you know, you can't walk and then eventually you can't use your arms, then your eyes start to droop and your neck starts to go and then your brain and your heart and everything goes. So it's a very insidious poison. For Robert Curley, the information came too late. The damage had already been done and the effects were irreversible. After suffering a massive heart attack, he was placed on life support. Soon after, he was declared brain dead. Robert's wife, Joanne, gave permission for her husband's life support to be turned off. A few hours later, Robert Curley was pronounced dead. The official cause of death was cardiopulmonary failure due to thallium poisoning. Now they had to determine how and where he came in contact with the deadly chemical. A representative of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was sent to investigate. Joanne Curley stated that prior to his death, Robert had been working on a major renovation on the campus of a local university. That sounds good. Soon after he began the job, Curley complained to co-workers of flu-like symptoms. By the end of the first week, he could barely walk. He said his feet right, felt Bob? like lead. His colleagues noticed that he looked sweaty and red-faced. 
Robert Curley would spend the next month in and out of hospitals, going from one medical crisis to another. The facility where Robert Curley worked housed chemistry labs, as well as rooms where chemicals were stored, including five containers of thallium salts. OSHA investigators began a painstaking examination of the chemistry lab. They needed to identify the source and remove it before others were injured. The team took numerous air samples and exhaustively tested various objects and rooms to determine if there was another source of exposure. They came up empty. There were no signs of tampering or leakage from any of the containers. They learned that Curley was storing cabinets in his garage that he had taken from the university chemistry labs. They searched his home, but found no traces of thallium on the cabinets. With no answers to explain her husband's death, Joanne Curley contacted a toxicologist at the hospital. She seemed terrified that she and her daughter might also have been exposed. She demanded that they be tested for thallium. Joanne Curley tested positive, but the amount of thallium in her system was not at a toxic level. She would not require treatment. Her daughter had even smaller amounts in her system, about 10 times less than her mother. Robert Curley had over 900 times the lethal dose of thallium. Doctors insisted that the high levels of the toxic chemical could not have come through skin absorption. He must have ingested a fatal dose. The hospital passed the test results on to the police. After ruling out suicide, police concluded that the poisoning was no accident. Robert Curley had been murdered. But who would want him dead? Investigators needed to know every aspect of Robert's daily routine. As police collected items from the house, Joanne told detectives that her husband would routinely take a half-gallon thermos filled with iced tea to work with him each day. Any tea left over at the end of the day was shared by the family that night at dinner. The half-gallon container was collected for future analysis. Two other thermoses were also collected, one quart-sized and the other a pint size. Joanne told investigators that neither of these two containers had ever been taken to work by her husband. All of the items collected were sent off to the lab and tested. While waiting for the results, police continued their investigation. They spoke with Robert's fellow employees. There were over 150 tradesmen on the renovation team at the university. Since they all worked at the place where Robert got sick, they were all considered suspects. Police had to determine if any of them had a motive to kill Robert Curley. But no one seemed to dislike the electrician. Robert's co-workers revealed that Joanne had recently come into a large sum of money. She had been awarded over a million dollars in a wrongful death suit after her first husband died in a traffic accident. The financial windfall was a source of friction. Robert wanted to use the money to start his own electrical contracting company. Plus she wanted the yard to be Joanne made it clear no, she had no intention not. of bankrolling her husband's dreams. It's my money. Well, we can talk no, about it. we can't. It's my money, and you're not getting it. Investigators learned that as a result of Robert's death, Joanne stood to collect an additional $300,000, 
as the sole beneficiary of several insurance policies. The information was enough for police to put Joanne on the suspect list. But since she and her daughter had also been poisoned, it seemed unlikely that she was the killer. In the lab, examiners tested nearly 100 items taken from the Curley's home. Only two of the items from the Curley home tested positive for thallium. The half-gallon thermos Robert took to work with him each day, and one of the smaller thermoses Joanne insisted never left home. For police, the findings were troublesome. Since thallium was found in a thermos Robert never took to work, there was no direct link between the poisoning and the university. Police began to suspect they had been looking in the wrong place for Robert's killer. The lab results were leaked and published by a local newspaper that was following the investigation. Joanne told police that she remembered something that would explain why the smaller thermos tested positive. She said that shortly after her husband was hospitalized, he called her and asked that she bring in pizza and iced tea for a farewell party for his roommate. Joanne said she transferred the remaining tea from the half-gallon thermos to the smaller container and took it with her to the hospital. As long as the half-gallon thermos remained the focal point of the investigation, Robert's co-workers could not be dismissed as suspects. And none of them had a reason to kill the electrician. The investigation hit another dead end, one that would last for the next three years. Three years after the poisoning death of Robert Curley, the Pennsylvania State Police took over the investigation. With no leads or suspects, investigators faced a challenge. Sergeant Dave Wondolowski was assigned to the case. The very first step, I, you know, I made a determination that we were going to start right back from scratch, right at the very beginning, and treat this as if the crime had occurred yesterday. Investigators began with the forensic findings. The original autopsy had not determined when and how often the murder victim had ingested thallium. Investigators feared the answers they needed had gone to the grave with Robert Curley. On August 23, 1994, Robert Curley's body was exhumed for examination. Hair and nail samples were taken from the body. Dr. Frederick Readers wanted to establish a timeline using Robert Curley's hair. What you can find out with the hair is when the poison was administered. The hair grows at the rate of about a third of an inch every month. So that you can take a small piece of a hair that's right at the root and you see what's happened just a few days ago. You take it at the tip, in this case it was a 19 centimeter tip, it's basically what happened just about a year earlier. The hair yeah, samples were tested using a furnace top. atomic absorption now instrument. See that's going to heat up. In this test, a sample is placed in a graphite tube and heated to the point of vaporization. A light is shined through the tube. The amount of light absorbed by the vapor determines if thallium is present and how much. Robert Curley's hair samples told an especially revealing story. The hair is long enough so that we can say that in November of 1990, he started getting thallium and probably even earlier. And that apparently then there was, a, a, you know, he, he got another dose around March of 1991. Another one, a smaller one perhaps, uh, sometime in April. And then he got a whopping dose in June. And then he continued to get doses because instead of going up and down, it just kept going up. Then there was a pause and then we found actually that towards the very end that it was going up like crazy. 
Robert Curley had started ingesting thallium well before he began working at the university. He had been slowly and methodically poisoned to death. Then, a final massive dose had been administered around the time he was last hospitalized. The one person with both motive and access was Joanne Curley. Investigators scoured Joanne's previous statements. Of particular interest was her account of bringing pizza and tea in a pint-sized thermos to Robert and his hospital roommate in the days before Robert's death. Investigators questioned the roommate, Richard Bonin. He gave them a very different story than the one Joanne had given a few years earlier. According to Bonin, neither he nor Robert had asked Joanne to bring them food or drink. Nor were they celebrating Bonin's departure, which did not take place for another two days. That night, according to his roommate, Curly's condition worsened dramatically. He was screaming in pain. Bowman summoned help. He distinctly recalled that Joanne served the iced tea in a large half-gallon thermos. Police believed Joanne had administered the last fatal dose to her husband as doctors tried in vain to save his life. On December 12, 1996, Joanne Curley was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. As part of a plea bargain agreement, Joanne confessed. Only months after she and Robert wed, she realized that the marriage had been a mistake. Divorce was a possibility, but the thought of Robert's life insurance policy tantalized her. An old jar of rat poison she discovered in the basement seemed to be the answer. She could rid herself of her husband and net nearly $300,000 in the bargain. Joanne laced Robert Curley's iced tea each day. To divert suspicion, she administered a harmless dose to her daughter and herself. For a time, her cover-up and frequent diversionary tactics worked. Joanne Curley eluded police for over five years. According to Pennsylvania State Trooper Robert McBride, the forensic findings were invaluable. The forensics gave us a timeline and time periods when people or the murderer would have had to have access to him. And by that means, we were able to exclude other potential suspects. This wasn't really an investigation. Normally, an investigation starts and you zero in on a suspect. This was totally opposite. This was an investigation of exclusion. We went about eliminating people until we got down to one. Joanne Curley was sentenced to serve 10 to 20 years in the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. Curley poisoned her victim slowly over time. While other killers aren't as methodical, the technique proves just as deadly. In this case, the names of the victims and killer have been changed. On January 30th, 1985, Patrolman Walter Wallace raced to Memorial General Hospital. As a veteran of the Roselle, New Jersey Police Department, he had often responded to medical emergencies. But this call was personal. The doctor informed Wallace that his wife, Beth, had collapsed and suffered a seizure. Wallace was stunned. His wife was fine when he left for work that evening. Beth had no history of seizures, and though she struggled with a weight problem, she had been in relatively good health. As Beth's vital signs rapidly failed, 
doctors could offer the patrolman little hope. She's not taking anything. She's dieting or anything. Nor could they find an explanation for her symptoms. Three hours later, Beth Wallace was dead. When we brought her in, we brought her immediately up. Beth and Walter had been married for 24 years and had three children together. Beth's mother, Rose Parker, was living with them when the tragedy occurred. Because of the sudden and mysterious nature of Beth Wallace's death, the doctor requested an autopsy. Cause of death was determined to be cardiac arrest. A month later, tragedy struck the Wallace home again. Rose Parker suffered a massive heart attack. Paramedics worked frantically to stabilize her and swiftly transport her to the hospital. But it was too late. Shortly after her arrival, Rose Parker died. At the Union County Prosecutor's Office, investigators learned of the deaths from Rose Parker's lawyer. The fact that two healthy women had died suddenly and within a month of each other seemed suspicious. He asked investigators to look into Walter Wallace. Assistant Prosecutor Richard Rodbart followed up on this information. Anytime you have a public official, much less a police officer, who is suspected as uh, being the perpetrator of a crime, uh, you have to be uh, extremely sure that the evidence points in that direction before you proceed and before you bring a case against that individual. To rule out foul play, investigators contacted Dr. Reng Lang Lin, chief toxicologist for the state of New Jersey. An examination of the file showed that no toxicology testing had been done. Rose Parker's body, they quickly learned, would yield no clues. There had been no autopsy. She'd been embalmed and buried. But at Beth Wallace's autopsy, tissue samples had been taken. These were sent off for extensive toxicological testing. It would be six weeks before investigators would receive the results. Captain Edward Johnson requested Walter Wallace's personnel file from the Roselle Police Department. From its contents, a portrait of the man emerged. Wallace was an exemplary police officer. He was popular with his superiors and peers. Nothing in the file was out of the ordinary or raised suspicions. Captain Johnson read the file in its entirety, including Wallace's military discharge papers. It showed him to have won several important medals and uh, listed a lot of combat service over in Vietnam. For whatever reason, I, I can't remember exactly what, what sparked it, but I was looking at it, and I was at first impressed by the record that this fellow had. Then there was something on a 214 that just didn't look right. Johnson contacted the U.S. Army to verify the record. His suspicions were confirmed. He never had any of those medals. He was never in Special Forces. In fact, uh, we, can only, we can't verify overseas service on the part of this man. So the 214 that was in the police department file was a forgery. Walter Wallace was a liar, but was he capable of murder? To find out, Investigators would need to talk with the people who knew him best, his fellow officers. There is a certain difficulty, obviously, in investigating a police officer for, for a crime because you have to go into his department, talk to people that he works with every day, and the more people you talk to, the more you're signaling where your investigation is going. Hi, Jeff. You got that file Investigators for me? made a low-profile visit to the Roselle Police Department while Wallace Thank was you. off duty. I'll get it back to you in a couple of days, okay? They didn't expect Wallace's colleagues to be forthcoming, but one officer surprised them. According to the officer, there was something perplexing about Walter's marital status. In 
He suspected that Walter had married a woman named Jacqueline Deal while he was still married to Beth. Investigators wondered, was Walter legally divorced or living a double life? Through Beth's friends, investigators learned Walter was away from home a lot. He told Beth he was being treated at a VA hospital for exposure to Agent Orange. And that's why sometimes for a week or so he might be gone, or he might be gone for the whole weekend, and she's not going to see or hear from him, and she's not going to be able to get in touch with him because the ward that he's in over at the hospital doesn't have any kind of telephone. He was pretty good, and for a while he was pretty good at juggling all of this. Investigators traveled to nearby Elizabeth, New Jersey, to question Wallace's other wife. Thank you. Well, Jacqueline Deal confirmed that she and Walter had been married on November 2nd, 1984, three months prior to Beth Wallace's death. She said Walter had divorced his wife the summer before. Walter had brought over the divorce papers when it was final, and the two had celebrated. I'm so excited. Investigators found the divorce decree among documents provided by Rose Parker's lawyer. Numerous irregularities made them question its validity. Investigators searched for the original divorce decree at the county courthouse. There was no record under the name of Wallace. They then searched under the case number, only to discover it belonged to somebody else's divorce. The case name clearly read Martin versus Martin, not Wallace versus Wallace. Police surmised that Wallace used his badge to obtain the Martin's divorce decree. Wallace altered the document in order to obtain a marriage license with Jacqueline. Investigators sent the document to the FBI lab for further analysis. They had caught Walter in another lie. And this one indicated a possible motive for murder. But investigators were perplexed. Why would Wallace fake a divorce and kill his wife rather than legally end the marriage? Looking for a potential financial motive, investigators scrutinized Beth's will. Walter stood to inherit everything, including the family house. But something about this document also caught the investigator's eye. The will was dated just two months prior to Beth's death. The timing seemed too convenient. Further investigation revealed the existence of an earlier will. In this version, Beth had left everything to her mother. She left only one dollar to her husband. Investigators wondered if he had forged the second will and then killed his wife. The new will was notarized by a secretary in the Roselle Police Department. But she denied ever witnessing the will or affixing her seal to the document. The secretary noted that Wallace often worked at her unlocked desk. He could have easily used her notary seal to certify a document without her knowledge. Investigators had built a strong circumstantial case against Walter Wallace. But they needed proof that his paper trail led to murder. Investigators in Roselle, New Jersey, suspected Officer Walter Wallace was responsible for the death of his wife, Beth. Now they hoped to support their circumstantial case with hard proof that Wallace poisoned her. Four months into the case, the New Jersey State Lab reviewed the results of a general toxicological screening of Beth's blood, tissue, and urine. Because the screen only tested for the use of illegal drugs and alcohol, it came up negative. Laboratory technicians went further, 
subjecting the samples to a battery of tests to rule out prescription drugs, heavy metals, and a number of ingestible toxins. Still, they found nothing to explain why Beth died. But they had yet to test for one particularly insidious killer, cyanide. Samples from the victim were prepared in test tubes. A color reagent was then added. If cyanide is present, a reaction occurs. Ultimately, the sample turned a dark shade of purple. Beth Wallace had cyanide in her system when she died. To determine the concentration of the poison, the sample was read by a spectrophotometer. A lethal dose of cyanide is about 2.5 milligrams per liter. Results showed that Beth Wallace had nearly twice that much in her blood and more than three times that amount in her spleen. The detective's next move was to tie Walter Wallace to the cyanide. Every detective that we had in the major crimes unit went out there and started banging on doors in the factory district that they have over in Roselle. We went to every, every one of them. It's like, well, do you think they have cyanide or not? Stop and ask. Do you have cyanide? Are you missing any? Did anybody ever come looking for any? Get any of it on your hands. Make sure you wash your hands because... The canvassing paid off. A clerk at a metal plating factory revealed that Wallace purchased a quantity of potassium cyanide. The officer told him he needed the chemical to raise the serial number on a handgun. On June 18, 1985, Walter Wallace arrived at police headquarters and was asked to report to the chief's office. There, he was placed under arrest and escorted to jail. A warrant was issued to search the Wallace residence. The prosecutor's office enlisted the aid of their narcotics team. Due to the nature of their work, team members are skilled at conducting meticulous searches. James Durkin was a member of that team. Once we got to the house, um, it was somewhat evident why the chief had asked us. The house was um, a littered mess from attic to basement. Um, and that particular day, we had a team up in the attic, as well as the basement, and we were going to meet in the middle. Police removed some 100 items from the Wallace home. Hey, Captain, is that something? A manual typewriter was found hidden behind the couch. Legal documents, including the original Martin divorce decree, were found in a drawer. Upstairs, the narcotic squad found a trap door leading to the attic. Writing samples, along with a page of forged signatures, were collected. Within 15 minutes, a team member discovered a crucial piece of physical evidence. Bingo. An empty bottle. What have you got? I'm missing the attic. The handwritten label read, potassium cyanide. The items were examined in the laboratory along with the divorce decree and will. A confiscated typewriter was found to have a spacing error consistent with the altered documents. More damaging, signatures on several of the papers were determined to be forged by tracing. Finally, cyanide was found in the bottle recovered from Wallace's attic. The label was in his handwriting. In May 1986, Walter Wallace was found guilty of bigamy and the first degree murder of his wife. Police theorized that Walter Wallace's double life was becoming too complicated. Instead of filing for divorce, Walter chose murder. But 
his attempt to finance a new life at his wife's expense was his undoing. Wallace was sentenced to serve from 30 years to life in prison. He was never charged or tried for the murder of his mother-in-law, Rose Parker, due to lack of evidence. The secret life of Walter Wallace was motive for murder. For other killers, the motive is far less complicated. In this case, the names of the victim and killer have been changed. On July 17, 1991, Dana Jacobs awoke to find her husband, Larry, violently ill. This is a little different. It seemed like food poisoning. He had intense stomach pain with vomiting and diarrhea. What's your stomach feel like? When his condition hadn't improved by morning, she decided to take him to the emergency room. She stopped at the neighbors to drop off their children. John Ballier was concerned. Larry had been in and out of the hospital for weeks with gastrointestinal problems. Jacobs was admitted at Humana Suburban Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Doctors administered intravenous fluids to keep him from dehydrating. There was cause for concern. Although he displayed the classic symptoms of food poisoning, he did not respond to treatment. Hello. The next day, Dana called John Ballier with tragic news. Her husband, Larry, was dead. She asked him not to say anything to the children until she could tell them in person. I think it had an impact on us, just having the kids there, having a good time, oblivious to the fact that their father had died and that their lives were gonna change probably dramatically. An autopsy was performed with Dana's permission. Doctors wanted to know what had killed the otherwise healthy 41-year-old man. Apparently, Jacobs had suffered a massive heart attack. Yet there was no indication of heart disease or what triggered the attack. His sudden death was considered a mystery. On Monday morning, John Ballier related the sad events of the weekend to his colleagues at the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And of course, the, the kids play together. Hey, John, how are you? Shortly afterward, Ballier received intriguing news from a fellow attorney. Oh, man, it's terrible. His brother-in-law owned a chemical company. Chemical. Dana Jacobs had been a recent customer. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you doing today? In fact, she came in the day her husband got sick. She purchased a chemical called colchicine. His brother-in-law only remembered the purchase because Dana's check had bounced. And his brother-in-law had called him, complaining about the fact that this check had bounced. Um, and he thought it was kind of an interesting coincidence that the, the two events involved the same family. Ballier researched the chemical. He found that colchicine in small doses is used to treat gout. Larger amounts could be fatal. He contacted Barbara Weekly Jones, Assistant Chief Medical Examiner for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There is a fine line between therapeutic levels, meaning giving um, relief from gouty arthritis, and uh, levels of the drug that can cause significant side effects. And the main side effects of this drug are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea which um, when it reaches a bad, uh, severe state can uh, cause death of an individual. Dr. Weekly Jones was aware that the general drug screen performed at autopsy would not reveal a specific toxin such as colchicine. She prepared blood and tissue samples for further testing. 
she was not optimistic the test results would prove definitive. If Jacobs had ingested colchicine, it had probably been eliminated from his bloodstream prior to his death. Their only hope was to find traces of the chemical in specific organs. Because the gastrointestinal tract absorbs it, uh, it gets partially metabolized in the liver and it gets excreted in the kidney. So those three organs would be the most likely areas to find any residual cochising at the time of the autopsy. It would take two weeks to obtain the test results. Investigators would have to wait for the answer to a crucial question. Had Larry Jacobs been murdered? Larry Jacobs, a 41-year-old father of two, had died of a mysterious stomach ailment. John Vallier, Jacobs' neighbor and a Commonwealth attorney, was suspicious. He assigned Detective Pat Conkling of the Jefferson County Police Department to investigate. Vallier told Conkling that the dead man's wife had purchased a potentially lethal chemical called colchicine just days before his death. The detective's first order of business was a visit to the state medical examiner's office. The results of Larry Jacobs' toxicology test had finally come in. He had 160 nanograms per milliliter of colchicine in his system. More than enough to kill him. Go ahead and take a seat. It was time to confront Dana Jacobs. I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you. First, I have to inform you that... But investigators were surprised by the reception they received. She invited us in. There was uh, no hint of any problems. She was very cordial with us. Uh, we never had the uh, first bit of hesitation on her part of talking with us. She readily admitted to buying the culture scene. She said she needed the substance to kill algae growing in her swimming pool. Investigators asked if she still had any left. She said she had used it all in the pool. I asked her how she uh, came across the chemical, and uh, she gave us the name of several businesses that uh, suggested that uh, she use this chemical to control the algae. Detectives contacted these businesses in an effort to confirm Dana's story. No one remembered telling her that colchicine could be used to control algae. In fact, most had never even heard of the substance. Investigators were at an impasse. They knew how Larry Jacobs died, but not why. Perhaps an examination of the couple's marriage would yield more clues. Investigators visited Larry's sister. She told police that the couple was in financial trouble as a result of Dana's compulsive spending. Family members had lent them thousands of dollars, none of which had ever been repaid. Larry told his sister that he had taken steps to keep Dana's spending under control, but to no avail. Their credit cards were at or over their limit. One of Larry's co-workers recalled having to lend him money on a business trip to pay for meals and a hotel room. The embarrassed engineer explained that he had neither cash nor available credit at the time. and there was insurance money. Larry had two life insurance policies on himself, one for $138,000 and the other totaling $250,000. Detectives dug deeper into Dana Jacobs' background. They learned that the respectable wife and mother had a troubled past. Before she was married, 
Dana had served time for bad check charges. From her prison records, investigators learned that a counselor had diagnosed her as a pathological liar who urgently needed psychiatric treatment. Dana Jacobs was arrested and indicted on murder charges in January of 1992. Police were certain they had cornered a killer. But a new clue was about to emerge, a clue that could possibly put her in the clear. Five months after Larry Jacobs' death, his widow Dana was indicted for murder. Out on bail, Dana was back at home with her children. Just weeks before her trial, she made a discovery that could exonerate her. A suicide note from her husband. In it, he said the financial strain was too much to bear. Investigators were skeptical, but the note did appear to be in Larry Jacobs' handwriting. Moreover, it was well known that the deceased had been depressed about money matters. With his background in chemical engineering, it was possible he was familiar with colchicine and used it to end his life. The suicide note was forwarded to Stephen Slater, the Commonwealth's document expert. The first thing he noticed was that different pens had been used. You'd have a paragraph or a sentence or two that's a fairly thin line, uh, small point writing instrument, and then it would shift to uh, a medium or a broad instrument for another word or two or three, and back again. It quickly became apparent that the note had been created by cutting and pasting words and phrases from Larry Jacobs' writings. After it was pasted up, uh, the close examination of the note showed that it had first been copied by passing it through a fax machine to produce a copy. In the five and a half months following her husband's death, Dana Jacobs spent close to $200,000, half of the insurance money she'd collected. One of her first purchases had been a fax machine. The suicide note she doctored represented a last desperate gamble to throw authorities off her trail. Another piece of damning evidence was provided by John Ballier's daughter. I know how she did it. Well, that's not something no. she'd say. No, Dad, I really do. I know how she did it. Sarah Ballier testified that she saw Dana Jacobs filling oh, no. clear gel caps with white powder. Mrs. Jacobs told the girl that she was making vitamins to put into her husband's food. She explained it was the only way she could get him to take his vitamins. Police theorized that Dana Jacobs used a familiar household routine to poison her unsuspecting husband. On November 23, 1992, Dana Jacobs was convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Lethal, but invisible, poison has historically enabled killers to strike without fear of reprisal. But unseen no longer means undetected. Thanks to advances in forensic science, detectives have new tools to catch the killer and unravel the mystery behind an invisible death.